Big dogs. Big dogs. I got one simple question for y'all. Do we think that the combination of Aaron Jones, Devontae Adams, and your choice, you get a choice. This is America. Your choice of James Robinson, Miles Sanders, Mike Davis, Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt. We're going to go with my boy Miles Sanders. He never lets us down, except for like 45 times this year. Do you think these three players are going to combine to score three touchdowns? Honestly, either of these Packers players might do it on their own. If you think that they are going to do this, if you think they'll score three touchdowns total, pass, rush, receiving, combined, then you will one and a half X any money that you throw down on this game. Aaron Jones and Demonte Adams, which I will go into heavily later on in this video, are playing against Jacksonville as 13-point favorites at home, meaning that they have an implied total of 32 and a half points for their team, okay? There is a 0% chance that these two do not leave the game with at least two touchdowns combined. We get Miles Sanders back as the workhorse against the G-Men. It's, or is he playing the Cowboys? He's playing the G-Men. I might be lying, whatever. I know the matchup is good, and I know these three will score at least three touchdowns. If you want to get dicey and you want to go four touchdowns, you're going to 3X whatever you put down on this. And what's beautiful is, Realistically, you're going to 6x it because if you are a first time depositor on monkeyknifefight.com and you use the promo code BDGE, you want to throw $10 down, you use the code, you'll get $20 in your account. You want to throw 20, you'll get 40 in your account. You want to throw 50, you'll get 100 into your account, which means you could throw it all down on this 3x it, we'll 6x it. 20, you turn it into 60. 50, you're going to turn it into 1 50. It's up to $50, the deposit bonus, but this is how you do it. Aaron Jones, Devonta Adams versus Jacksonville. Miles Sanders, we're going to have to check that because this is driving me fucking crazy right now. I'm almost positive they're playing against the Giants, and Snacks is going to lose his fucking mind this week. They are. Beautiful. He's back. He's going to be a baller. He's going to score a touchdown. These three easily score three. If you want to get dicey, go with four. This is how we're bringing home the revenue this week. This is not a guarantee. This is not a lock. All I do is monkey. All I do is lose monkey knife fight bets, okay? I love you. Back to the previously scheduled programming. MonkeyKnifeFight.com, promo code BDGE. What's cracking, big go folks? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the headquarters, HQ. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs got to eat. Fantasy football. We're talking week 10 rankings, specifically running backs and wide receivers, because nobody else fucking mad is in fantasy football. Am I right? Am I right? No. But we're going to do running backs and wide receivers because that's what I want to do today. Got a new energy drink on the horizon. Go Sour Patch. I want to say this actually just came out and I got my hands on it. Zoom in on it, you bench. You know, this is actually a touchscreen camera. Oh, look how clear that looks. It smells really funky, but it tastes just like Sour Patch Kids, which is fucking incredible. I don't know how we do half the things that we do as humans. This is as impressive to make an energy drink that actually tastes like a Sour Patch Kid is equally as impressive to me as us landing on the moon makes no sense like what do you do when you're making the drink like you're in a factory and you're like oh that tastes a little whatever not like sour patchy what do we do do we just is it just like when you're in college and you want to make a big jungle juice of shit and it tastes too much like vodka or everclear so you just keep throwing more fruit or more juice into it is that what they did they just like took what they had and it just kept pouring batches of Sour Patch Kids into it, which wouldn't make sense because there's no calories in this. It's sugar free. So there's no Sour Patch Kids in the equation. Okay. It's going to be one of those episodes. A little bike story action here. So Ghost is like, uh, I'm, there has to be some kind of overlap with some of my audience and the people that follow like fitness influencers on YouTube. Uh, Ghost has basically built their brand. They're, they're a fitness nutrition company that focuses on supplements so they make like pre-workout energy the uh pre-workout energy supplements they make obviously energy drinks now shit like that and uh their main form of marketing has been like influencer marketing so they partnered up with really big influencers on youtube like christian guzman and max tuning and those guys and that's kind of how they got started off and that's they kind of just like siphon those dudes audiences but for those of y'all that know Max Tuning and, and Christian Guzman and those guys in that like uh in that realm those are the dudes who actually made me want to start doing YouTube stuff. They used to vlog all the time. Uh, they basically vlog only now. It's like their lifestyle kind of shit. And I stopped watching. But when I first originally got into like YouTube and first got into like watching people that did like fitness shit, like those were guys that I watched. 
and I would watch them vlog and I would always be like, yeah, I could do that. I could do something on YouTube. And it kind of like branched off from those dudes. So my life has come full circle. So shout out to Ghost. I bought that off GNC. I'm not sure where else they sell it, but it's fucking phenomenal. I don't understand it. I don't understand how you make a Sour Patch Kids energy drink. See the fucking veins coming through. I think that's the Sour, the sour Patch. It's like the bottom of the bag sugar coming through my veins right there. All right. This has gotten out of control. Robert, put a timestamp in the beginning of that. Be like story time ends now. So we're looking at the rankings. If at any time you want to just go grab the rankings, they are available on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash B-D-G-E. You could also text B-D-G-E 646-328-6601. We're going to be doing a lot of giveaways. We're going to be answering some of your questions. When we do Q&As at the end of Fade the Public or some of the other random shits, they're most likely going to go through text. And yes, the first couple you're going to receive are automated. Obviously, I had to set up a welcome message for y'all. Welcome, bike to the text messages. But after that, it's all straight from my fingertips. All right, y'all ready? Let's tuck our shirts in. Let's stop yelling and let's see. We're going to quickly, quickly run through injuries right now before I get into my actual rankings. We're just going to go through guys that I think are, you know, ranked way too low or ranked way too high and where I have them and why I have them there. Where and why I have them. That's what we're going to do. But quick injury updates. Uh, Nick Chubb with the knee is expected to return. He's been practicing in limited. They're going to make a call by tomorrow, by Friday. But I do fully expect him to be ready to roll and handle, you know, at least 80 to 90% of what he normally would have coming back from the MCL. David Montgomery is still in the concussion protocol. Again, he has till Monday to get cleared, so I do expect him to get cleared. Joe Mixon, limited at practice still, still dealing with his foot that was supposedly day-to-day. Don't ever fucking believe a word that comes out of coach's mouth when it comes to injuries. So continue to hold on to Gio Bernard because we don't know what's going on with Mixon. I would say Probably 50-50, 60-40, maybe in favor of playing. Darrell Henderson did not practice yesterday, which is possibly a problem. We'll talk about a little bit more later into Zai video. Kalen Balaj, not hurt, just sent right back to the practice squad right after that game. David Johnson, in concussion protocol, didn't practice yesterday, not expected to suit up on Sunday per Adam Schefter. Devonta Freeman returned to practice with the ankle injury on a limited basis. Still does definitely not guarantee him suiting up for their matchup against Philly. So keep an eye on that. Chris Carson and Carlos Hyde both did not practice again on Wednesday, which will probably end up leaving DJ Dallas and Travis Homer to take the majority of snaps in that bike field. And we have Justin Jackson with the knee. Uh, They said he's probably going to rest him throughout this week of practice. I don't think he's going to end up suiting up. If he doesn't practice this week, he probably will not play. Mark Ingram, ankle. They're hopeful to get him back for the Patriots game on Sunday night, but we'll have to see. Again, high ankle sprains do not do not do not heal quickly. And when you come back in three to four weeks, like we saw last year with Alvin and we saw Saquon, you know, so weird when you talk about like professional athletes and you just say their first name, like you think about it from a normal perspective. Like if you're in the locker room, you call people by their first name. Like if you're a player, right? Like those dudes are just your friends or your, your teammates or whatever. But when you say like Alvin Kamara and you don't say Kamara at the end of it, when you just say Alvin, it's fucking weird. Like I want to call him uncle Alvin. Who the fuck's name is Alvin, Alvin Kamara, right? Start putting these weird things on a pedestal. And when you stop saying the full name, it's fucking weird, bro. Alan Kamar is not weird, though. I actually kind of is weird. I've seen him do interviews before. But beside the fucking point, let's get into thy running back rankings. The guys that stick out to me initially are a lot of the guys taking over for, for guys that are injured, right? We have Mike Davis, who is stepping in for Christian McCaffrey because McCaffrey's very likely not going to be playing in week 10. I'd be very surprised if he suited up. And Mike Davis comes in as running back 12 or 13 for me. ECR has him right there around 11 or 12. This is obviously a very tough run defense. They're going against Tampa Bay. These two teams did play in week two. Interesting numbers. Predictably, uh, C-Max struggled on the ground. He went like 18 for 59, 3.3 yards per carry. He did score twice, caught four or five targets for 29 yards. Mike Davis came in at the end of the game because that was the week that C-Mac got hurt. And Mike Davis caught eight of eight targets, 74 yards. So you're talking about 
13 targets between the two of those guys, along with 19 carries for C-Mac and Mike Davis. So a very hefty workload despite the tough matchup. A lot of it was in it was in garbage time, and I do not expect Mike Davis to produce on the ground in this one, but it should be a big PPR day for Mr. Davis, for Mr. Michael. Uh, we saw him kind of start to wind down a little bit in that workhorse role when Christian McCaffrey was out, right? The last couple games he was in, he did not perform effectively as compared to the first couple games he was in. And, you know, two of those games were predictably struggling games for him because he played Chicago, he played New Orleans, and those are two very, very tough defenses to run against. Again, this is Tampa Bay where it's predictably going to be very, very tough for him to run successfully against. So it's hard to look at him as like the surefire RB1 we kind of thought he was after the first couple weeks, but he is a sure start and he always has that chance to kind of fall into the end zone, probably get five, six targets, 12 to 18 fantasy points is probably where we can expect him to land in. The Panthers are five and a half point dogs in this one, a healthy 50.5 over under. So we like it. We like it. We also kind of like Dookie. Dookie Johnson here. I got him at running back 14. ECR is in running back 27. They obviously have not updated it since. We've heard the news that David Johnson probably will not play, which means Duke will operate as thy workhorse in the Houston Texans by field. Now, with him out last week when he left the game with the Conco, Duke Johnson stepped in and was the featured back. He got all the opportunities. He got all the targets. He got all the carries for the running backs in Houston. Okay. Now, that alone, that alone will get you into high-end RB2, low-end RB1 conversation. The Browns defense, who they will be matching up against this week, while they aren't the Bucks, they have been decent against running backs, if not good, for fantasy this year. And there's really not much more to say. I mean, I'll be starting him pretty confidently, but like David Johnson, even with the featured workload in this offense, it's not one that passes to the running backs there, that offense, not one that you see explosive plays come from the running game. So, even like, like, like David Johnson, like even Duke Johnson in a feature workload, the ceiling is not really massive. And I talked about it earlier on this week. He's just, I don't know, like his 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 athletics and his player profiler profile shows us that he's explosive. I don't really see too much explosivity, explosiveness coming from Duke Johnson when I watch him. I don't think he's that talented of a running back, but it doesn't matter because the work ro- workload is there. So he's top 15 running back for me this week. Now we talked about Darrell Henderson. And my advice right now, as much as I love him rest of season, because I thought he was healthy, is to tread lightly with Darrell Henderson. I was super excited about him going forward, but he didn't practice Wednesday. And you guys will already have probably seen the practice reports for Thursday and possibly even Friday by the time this video drops. Coming off the bye. So straight up, like Sean McVay was like, yeah, he'll be fine. He'll be ready to roll for week 10. Straight up, it's just lying to our face. Okay. Huge farce. Dealt with the hip injury. In week eight, that forced him out of the game. He missed the remainder of the game. If he does play, it's likely that he's doing so at less than 100%. The other thing to consider here is Seattle. You think of this Seattle defense, and you're like, this is the worst pass defense. This is the worst defense in the history of mankind. Like, doctors could not have made a worse pass defense if they did it in a fucking laboratory, okay? They went into a lab, and they were like, we're going to let Russ cook. They did whatever the opposite of letting Russ cook in a lab is for this pass defense. However, 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 and partly because teams obviously need to pass the ball on this team and they do so successfully, which takes away from any production that they might have on the ground. Otherwise, objectively, they've been very good against the run. Right now, PFF has the Seattle defense as the number one graded run defense in the NFL. They are number nine per football outsiders. They have allowed the third fewest rushing yards on the year to running backs. Only the Bucks and the Colts have allowed fewer rushing yards on the year. Two other things to note, they will have Jamal Adams bike in full health. He was back last week. He made some plays, one and a half sacks, but he missed a lot of time. So it's possible he wasn't at 100% yet. Now he will be full strength. He is a top five run defending safety in the NFL. So that's obviously a big upgrade to that defense, as well as bringing up Snack. The only Snacks we acknowledge, Snacks Harrison. He was signed. He is going to be activated, and he is a run defense specialist. Excuse me. These energy drinks are making me burp all day. I got to stop drinking that shit. What kind of grown-ass man drinks Sour Patch fucking energy drinks? I don't know. So with the territory being a terrible pass defense, You're obviously letting up a lot of stats through the air to these running backs, okay? They have allowed a lot 
to opposing running backs in terms of receptions and targets and receiving yards. But number one, I don't trust Sean McVay to give that work to Henderson, even if they do end up getting a piece of that pie. Number two, Henderson has barely been involved through the air. Like, I bet you would be shocked. If you don't look when I ask this question, you would be very surprised at the numbers that Darrell Henderson has put up so far through the air. On the year so far, he's played in eight games. He has 15 targets and 10 catches. Barely over one catch per game for Darrell Henderson. It's sad. It's sad. Sad with an exclamation point for Darrell Henderson. Because he's been so good this year otherwise. Last year, the Rams were dead last in the NFL in terms of targeting their running backs. They threw to their running backs on 10% of their throws. This year, that is 14%. So they went from dead last up to 31st in the NFL. So they ain't getting it there. So tread lightly when it comes to Darrell Henderson. Someone I do like, though, this, this week, and a lot of moving parts here, is Troy Main Pope. Running back 27 in my rankings, running back 55 in ECR. He's coming off a concussion. He is cleared of the protocol. He is bike practicing in full. Troy Main Pope will be playing this week. The, the Chargers straight up like called up Kalen Balaj for a game, let him do real well, and then immediately sent his ass back to the fucking practice squad. This is literally the NFL equivalent of a nut appointment. For all you ladies listening out there, a dick appointment. Or for all y'all that stay on the same side, also a dick appointment. This is the NFL equivalent of that. Right? Like Jay-Z said it best. Came, saw, conquered. Literally. What the Chargers basically did, they with Kalen Balaj, they hit up their booty call late night because their wife, their girlfriend, their second wife on the side wasn't available. And don't get me wrong, she's hot, right? You can even you can even pull in Adam Gase to the equation here, right? Kalen Balaj without Adam Gase is like is like that cute girl who gets a boyfriend, Adam Gase, and then she stops taking care of herself, right? She gets um, complacent and maybe she gains a little bit of weight and she just completely goes off the deep end. And as soon as they break up, they break up, right? Kim Blige leaves Adam Gase. The glow up is bike. She realizes she's like, oh, fuck. I'm single. I got to start working out again. I got to start looking good again. I got to start posting fucking selfies on social media. That's where we're at with Kaylin Blige. Sad story because it looks like her Instagram account got deactiv- deactivated, right? He gets put down back on the fucking practice squad. We were saying something about Troy Main Pope, I think, right? Yeah, well, he's, he's bike after his concussion. This is assuming Justin Jackson is out, like I said earlier. If he is active, this kind of all just goes to shit. So Troy Main Pope in week eight played the RB2 role. And it's very clear that they do not trust Josh Kelly. I mean, RB2 to Justin Jackson. Justin Jackson, Troy Main Pope, Josh Kelly. They do not trust Justin fucking Joshua Kelly as the guy. They let Kalen Blage run the show after last week. And at this point, Josh Kelly is basically reserved for like when the lights come on at the end of the night at the bar. We're going to start calling him Joshua Last Call Kelly. That's his nickname from now on. Now, Pope went 10 for 67 on the ground. He also saw seven targets, caught five of them for 28 yards. So you're talking about 17 opportunities for the RB2 on this team. And here's why. The Chargers right now, I know we're all excited about Justin Herbert, but I want to put some context behind what this offense is actually doing right now. Over the last five weeks, the Chargers have averaged 30.6 points per game, never scored fewer than 26 points in any of those five games. Only three teams in the NFL are averaging more points per game than what the Chargers have done over the last five weeks. That's an offense that you want an RB in and to be a part of, okay? And more so, the pace The number of plays that they're running is an absurd amount right now. Right now, the Chargers are the fourth fastest paced offense in the NFL. Justin Herbert is averaging 75.6 plays per game. That is insane. If you took that number and put it back to last year, that would be by far and away the highest number of plays per game for any team, for any quarterback in the NFL. And it wouldn't have been particularly close. Uh, So to make that simple, 75.6 plays per game, If he were to throw the ball 40 times a game, which is a very high number, that's like Matt Ryan, fucking dirt cutter who can't run the fucking ball to save his goddamn job, which his job keeps being saved because that's how the Falcons' corrupt fucking franchise works. Ipso facto, if Justin Herbert throws the ball 40 times a game, that still leaves 36 running back touches to be had in this offense. Again, you want a part of this bike field. You just have to choose the right guy. And by process of elimination... No Eckler, 
No Justin Jackson. Kalen Balaj back to the practice squad. If Justin Jackson's out, it's possible that they call Balaj back up. And it gets a little bit messy. I would assume it would be a Balaj and Troy Main Pope kind of split committee there, okay? And I would probably be comfortable trotting out either of these guys, probably more so Troy Main Pope because he'll probably serve as the pass catcher. But Kelly is down Zetotim Pole. Okay, that's my Charger spiel. That's the electricity, no pun intended, that we had to get into the fucking episode today. Jonathan Taylor. I have him at running back 31. I have no fucking idea why he's still ranked at running. I feel like I'm, this is deja vu of Devin Singletary. Like three weeks ago, it was RB 31 versus 20. And then the next week, it was like 36 versus 26. And it kept moving back and back and back. And this is what's happening with Jonathan Taylor. I have him at 31. ECR has him at 20. So you're telling me at running back 20 that you are confidently starting JT as your RB2. I just don't know how you could do that. He's getting like a 25 to 30% snap share. He's not catching passes. He's fumbling the ball. I mean, he's a guy I'm going to need to see be good on the football field or at least be good in fantasy via volume, via whatever the fuck he needs to do to do so for him to get back into my lineup. So Jonathan Taylor... I would I would I would start JD McKissick over Jonathan Taylor right now. We had Antonio Gibson miss practice on Wednesday with a shoulder injury. I don't know if that played into the limited snaps last week. I don't know if that is a new thing that happened over the last couple of days. I'm assuming, you know, when you're an NFL player and it's Monday, Tuesday, you're not going around fucking ramming your shoulder into things. So it probably happened in the game, which led to JD McKissick playing on 83% of the snaps. The score also led to him doing that. But JD McKissick is getting a shitload of work in the passing game and in a PPR league. I like McKissick a lot. And while we're on the subject of sleepers, I mean, last week we called Rex Burkhead. Lo and behold, fucking Burke got goaded up, got in the end zone, caught a lot of balls, got a lot of touches. Shit was beautiful. And with Damian Harris likely out with that chest injury, I actually haven't seen any really updates. I think they might activate Sony Michelle. It might be Rex Burkhead's backfield again, but they are playing Baltimore, so I don't really want to fuck a part of that. But let's go with Jamal Williams here. Let's go with Jamal Williams was on the COVID list for last game. He's fine. He's clear. He's going to be playing. They play the Jags. The Jags are starting Jake Luton, okay? They're playing in Lambeau. I know he looked fine in his first start, but you're a rookie. You're traveling to Lambeau. Not a good equation. Not a good cocktail for you to end up. You're going to end up blacked out on the floor, waking up with two fucking double cheeseburgers in your hand, a bite out of each of them. That's what Jake Luton's about to do. Pick up the Green Bay defense also if they are available on your waiver wire. I believe they're still available in like 40% of Yahoo leagues if you need a streamer. The Packers are 13-point favorites in this one, and I think that's probably going to get even higher as we get closer to the weekend with an over-under of 50 points. 50 points, 13-point spread. That means their implied point total as a team is 32 and a half. That is like four to five touchdowns they expect them to score. Obviously, Aaron Jones is going to blow his whole load in this one, and he is my RB1 in the rankings for the entirety of the week. Again, if you want the full weekly rankings and you want dynasty rankings and you want all this shit, patreon.com forward slash BDGE. That will also get you access into tomorrow's live stream on YouTube, the Q&A where y'all can ask me any of your sit-start questions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You get access to Discord, patreon.com forward slash BDGE. So, Jones going to go nuts, but the Jag the Jags are meh at defending the run. And uh, with this game script, I think there's going to be volume for Jamal Williams to also produce as like an RB3 flex play comfortably for you. And you look at the two games this year where the Packers covered that point spread, right? They won by 13 or more. So that's the kind of game script we can expect. And Aaron Jones was playing, right? Because I don't want to take it out of context. We don't want to start talking about games where Aaron Jones was playing because that's not relevant to what Jamal Williams is going to do this weekend in those two games. Jamal Williams averaged 12 touches and 84 total yards from scrimmage. One of those games, he caught eight passes. He gets into the end zone, into the fourth quarter. I think there's a decent shot there. I think there's a decent shot there. And then you're looking at a nice RB2 finish somewhere in like the 10 to 15 fantasy point range. And you are going to be happy starting him in a desperate, 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 desperate spot like Jamal Williams as a sleeper this week. Let's flip the script. Let's move over to thy pass catchers, thy wide receivers. Now we're going to throw this chart up on the screen for y'all. And these are who PFF expects to see shadow coverage this week. Hey, okay. So very tough matchup for DJ Chark. Again, I just explained that this is going to be a tough matchup for Jake Luton. 
going to Green Bay. They are going to be without LaVisca Chenault and their weapon in which Luton basically force-fed all of the targets last week too. DJ Chark is going up against Jair Alexander. And Jair Alexander is the number one rated coverage cornerback per PFF, number three per player profiler among 125 or 120 qualified cornerbacks. Now, if you want to see the coverage ranking of these players, you can't do it on PFF for free. You need to have a subscription to their service. However, you could do so for free on Player Profiler. Let me show you how. It's pretty fucking simple. You go to playerprofiler.com and you type in the receiver that you are looking for. And guess what pops up? Who they are going to be facing. Jair Alexander, right there. So you have the cornerback matchup. You have the cornerback rank. I swear they just switched that because it was three when I made the chart a couple days ago. And then the coverage rating. So coverage rating positive means that they are very good. The worse you get negative means you are not good. So playerprofiler.com, this info is completely free and one of the best helpful most helpful bestest resources out there on the web use their cornerback matchup tool please please for your own good so you can stop asking me questions playerprofiler.com who else we got travis fulgham expected to get the james bradbury treatment now at this point like he has done enough travis fulgham to the point where i'm not saying he's matchup proof but i don't really care uh, about what's happening right now because he has just been so good this year. Week four, he's played in five games. Here are his lines in the five straight games. Two for 57, touchdown. 10 for 152, touchdown. Six for 75, touchdown. This next game was the game against the Giants. 11 targets, five catches, 73 yards, didn't score. But still, five for 73, nice, mwah, nice, beautiful, rounded number right there. Not rounded, not beautiful whatsoever. Some, I don't even know what I'm saying. Dallas, six for 78 and a touchdown. So you're talking about going over 70 yards in four or five, scoring in four or five, seeing 13, 10, 11, and seven targets over the last four weeks. Until Travis Fulgham shows us what he's doing in fantasy is not actually him. I'm going to keep rolling him out there pretty confidently. And I have him up at, let me see where I have these guys ranked at, the ones that are getting shadow coverage. DJ Chark at wide receiver 20. I think coming off last week's game, I mean, you have to be kind of excited about it. But the Jair Alexander coverage means he moves all the way down there. So I'll probably continue to move him down, to be honest with you. And I have Travis Fulgham at 23. So I would I would consider playing Fulgham over DJ Chark. And I probably will end up doing that. I'll continue to adjust my rankings throughout the week. But obviously, James Bradbury is no slouch in his own right. We have D-Hop going against Tredavious White. Now, D-Hop is just someone that you can't rank low. So it, take that for what it is. Um, Tredavious White, we've seen him be beat this year. We've seen, we saw him be beat last year by a, a strong physical receiver like D-Hop in DK Metcalf. So not unbeatable, but obviously not a enviable matchup for D-Hop. Stephon Diggs is going to get Patrick Peterson, who has been about average, maybe a little bit above average. We know Patrick Peterson. He's not his former elite self that he had been in what we've been accustomed to seeing for so long. But Diggs is getting an absurd amount of volume, so he will still continue to be in like my top six, eight fantasy wide receivers for the season. And then we've got Terry against Desmond Trufant. And uh, this is just fucking gorgeous because Desmond Trufant, his name still kind of rings a bell for some people, for some fucking Falcons fans. But for the rest of us, we can sleep easy because he fucking stinks. And he has stunk this year. And Terry McLaurin is going to have some light work ahead of him for week 10 when they face off against Detroit and this abysmal ground defense, this abysmal pass defense. It's all beautiful t for Terry, except for Alex Smith throwing the ball to him. But we saw last week that wasn't really a problem. So Terry, I probably can't have him high enough, but he's wide receiver seven right now for me. Those are who we got getting shadow coverage this week. Who else do we like? We love Brandon Cooks. We love Brandon Cooks. I got him as a top. I think I have him up at like 17 or 16 right now. It's been absolutely fire these last three to four games. Since they got rid of Bill, since they got rid of Bill and everything in me is trying really hard not to say Uncle Bill because Bill Belichick is Uncle Bill. I got so many fucking uncles. We got Uncle Bill. We got Uncle Bill the second. We've got fucking Uncle Alvin. We've got Uncle Lenny. Damn, I got way too many uncles right now. This doesn't even fucking make sense. My my grandma needs to stop having kids. Since they let go of Bill, Brandon Cooks has seen at least nine targets in all four games. He has scored in three of those four games. He has averaged 
17.2 half PPR fantasy points per game over those four games. Didn't have any bus games. He is continuing to play at a high level and continuing to be a huge piece of this offense, which is what we missed from him in the beginning of the year. I think he might have came into the year with a little bit of an injury. All right. Week 10 against Cleveland. Cleveland has allowed the fifth most fantasy points per game to wide receivers in 2020. 36.7 36.7 fantasy points per game to wide receivers this year. That is what they are allowing on average per game. Brandon Cooks, do the fucking math. It adds up. Deshaun Watson has been absolutely on fire too. And with David Johnson likely to miss this game, they will continue to air the ball out. So we love Brandon Cooks. I also like Tim Patrick a lot more than consensus. Wide receiver 32 compared to wide receiver 42 for ECR. I don't know why people are still sleeping on Timmy P. Timmy, Timmy Patty, Timmy Patty Mayonnaise, man. He scored or went over 100 yards in four of his last five games. Now he gets my guy, Nevin Lawson, against the Raiders this weekend. Las Vegas is sending out Nevin Lawson, who is 82nd. He is ranked 82nd of 120 qualified cornerbacks in coverage rating. This is a beautiful matchup for Tim Patrick, okay? Now, there's another healthy over-under in this game, 51 points. Broncos are five-point dogs, which means the game script should be nice for Tim Patrick. They're playing in beautiful 70-degree weather. Sign me up for more Tim Patrick in the flex spot. And I'm coming bike to Corey Davis in the flex spot as well, man. I think you can go right back to him. You know, they're going to struggle on the ground because nobody can run the ball against Indy. Nobody can run the ball against the Colts. And with most of the attention from the pass defense and Xavier Rhodes, who was top five in terms of coverage rating this year per player profile, Per PFF, all of it. He is fucking bike all the fucking jokes about him, all roads close or whatever. On Twitter this offseason, he heard them shits. And he's really good this year. So while I think Davis has been consistently great this year, he's coming off the one dud game, so no one wants to trust him again. But with this offense, they're going to shove on the ground. Most of the focus is going to be on A.J. Brown. And I think this dictates a great matchup for Corey Davis, who who is going to see coverage from Rocky Sin. okay? That is just a wildly incredible, underrated, iconic name. Like, what a birth name. Rock Yasin. I actually don't even... Is your last name Yasin? This guy this guy's not even Asian, right? I think he's black. I I would love... I would... I needed to be in the hospital when they named him. Rock. Rock Yasin. I could make a song based off of Rock Yasin. Gonna rock Yasin. Gonna get beat down the scene. Gonna... Let up a lot of cream. Fucking, I hate myself so much. He's 92nd ranked, 92nd graded in coverage per PFF. Okay, so he's fucking stinks this year. He stinks, but Xavier Rowe has been really good. Their run defense is really good, which means everything should be funneling to Corey Davis, and he should get back to what he was doing just a few weeks ago, being consistent, scoring double-digit fantasy points week in and week out. Flex Corey Davis in week 10. Curtis Samuel is also a very interesting flex play with C-Mac out. He has now seen five targets or more in four straight games. He is getting three to four carries a game and he will continue to get that. They will continue to involve him on the ground because Mike Davis is not really adding an explosive element to their ground game while Curtis Samuel is. A lot of them are coming in the red zone, man. He's getting a lot of rushing touchdowns. He's got two over the last three weeks. He's got four total touchdowns over the last four weeks. Two in the air, two on the ground. He's getting involved everywhere. He's getting peppered with fucking touches here, there, everywhere. With C-Mac out, I expect that to continue to be the case. Now, I'm not as sold on Samuel. I don't have him ranked like super high. I want to say I have him as like a borderline wide receiver three, maybe like 35. Yeah, 35. What a fucking guess by me. So in terms of the guys we just talked about, we have Tim Patrick at 32, Mike Evans at 33, Corey Davis, 34, and Curtis Samuel at 35. Ooh, this is ugly. I actually have Curtis Samuel one spot above DJ Moore. You hate to see that. You really fucking hate to see that. We've also got Jarvis Landry up at 28. I think he's a guy that you can pretty confidently start in week 10. Jacoby Myers is someone that we need to talk about because he's coming off a big game. I know everyone's going nuts about his uh, target share and whatnot, but here's the thing. Here's the thing about Jacoby Myers, and I'm going to talk shit for the second straight week, and hopefully I just hit on one of these weeks where I don't sound like an idiot. Two weeks ago against San Fran, four for 60. Okay, game. The next week, got 10 targets, but six for 58. Okay, game. This week, he blasted off. 12 for 169. We all watched the game, unfortunately. And uh, it was against the Jets. I'm not, like, buying into that very much. I am curious because Marlon Humphrey is back from the COVID list. 
which means he'll be playing for the Ravens, which means he will be thy slot receiver. And this is just a terrible matchup overall. I feel like Cam Newton's going to get sacked upwards of 52 times. And uh, I wanted to check out, since Marlon Humphrey is back at slot, I want to see what his slot rate has been. Kobe Myers. Typically, people, when they make content, they prepare for it. And, uh, and they would have these numbers ready for you. This is what you get here. You get off the top, off the dome, straight to your face holes, what we're doing here. Week eight, he ran more snaps in the slot than he did out wide. This previous week, God, this is ridiculous. He ran 80 snaps. He was on the field for 80 snaps. This Patriots offense probably has not even sniffed 80 snaps since fucking pre-Belichick era. 80 snaps, 57 out wide, 22 in the slot. Okay, so maybe he does avoid Marlon Humphrey coverage. It's not much better on the outside when you got fucking Marcus Peters and these guys out here. I'm actually, like, really curious about this. I want to see when the last time a fucking Patriots player had 80 snaps in a game. Yeah, that's by far and away their season high. This year, I'm going to go back to last year and see if Brady had a single game with 80 snaps in it. No, he did not. Yeah, so I'm not I'm not expecting these these same game. If anything, I think they'll probably take a step back and have, like, 20 less plays, if not 25 fewer plays. You see how I switched up from less to fewer? My grammatical fucking conscious is on another level i hate myself so much so i think the plays are going to be well down which obviously means that the opportunity share for a guy like jacoby myers in the passing game is going to be down this is baltimore probably going to dictate the time of possession they are going to dictate how this game goes they're going to keep it heavy on the ground as they usually do and they're going to keep beating the fuck out of the patriots offense so i don't know why i just wasted so much time on jacoby myers but i did what else do we got defense streaming special teams uh, in terms of guys that might be on your wire, again, I talked about Green Bay. Go get them. 13-point favorites, inexperienced quarterback, in Lambeau. Like, this is exactly why you pick up a team like this. The other one that I consider that's, like, very, very low-owned, Minnesota. They're good against the run, and they're getting to play against Chicago, okay? So, when you're good against the run, you can't def- defend the pass. Like, your only hope is hoping that it's a shitty quarterback. And lo and behold... They are playing Chicago, who, if you guys remember correctly, has Nick Foles as a quarterback, and if you remember even more correctly, is a really shitty quarterback, okay? So those are my two, like, streaming defenses that will probably be widely available. We could talk about the tight ends, but I'd really rather not because in a, in a week we're at where Kelsey and George Kittle are both not playing, like, tight ends are fucking ugly, okay? I got Darren Waller as a one, obviously. TJ Hawkinson as a two. Dallas Goddard. With Zach Ertz still out is the three. This is what we've all been waiting for. This is what we've been waiting for, for Dallas Goddard to break out. He's got the field to himself. Okay. They, they have their wide receivers still hurting. Deshaun Jackson. I don't know if Alshon Jeffrey's going to be on the field. If he is, I don't give a shit, to be honest. This is what we've been waiting for. Rob Gronkowski right behind him against Carolina. I could probably move him up, but they have the, the conundrum here is the fact that they have a lot of weapons on the field, right? Godwin, Evans, Brown, all healthy. So Gronk kind of moves down the pecking order, but the Carolina defense is so, so bad against opposing wide receivers, uh, opposing uh, tight ends, I should say. Let me pull up their points allowed. Did I make this up? Am I lying? Are they not that bad against the Panth- or Are they not that bad against opposing tight ends? Mm, I think I might have just lied. I think I may have just lied. So what else is fucking new? Over the last five weeks, okay, they're bottom 10. They're bottom 10. Over the last five weeks, they have actually, you know what? I didn't lie. Fuck you. I didn't lie. Over the last five weeks, they have allowed the single most receptions to the tight end position and the single most receiving yards to the tight end position. They've only allowed two touchdowns, which is why in terms of points per game, they are only number 10, but touchdowns are fluky. They come and go and Tom Brady loves throwing to the tight end in the red zone. So most receptions, most receiving yards to the tight end position. This is a very good matchup for Rob Gronkowski. I will be starting him confidently i also have austin hooper as a number 10 because they're playing against the texans and austin hooper's gonna be back he's ready to go and the texans are also horrible against opposing tight ends they have allowed the third most fantasy points per game over the last five weeks against fucking tight ends i don't even listen to what i say and i just repeat my shit they are bad against the tight ends okay so this is a good matchup for austin hooper and of course they don't have odell beckham jr 
And uh, that's really all I got at the tight end that I like. I don't hate Mo Alley Cox this week with Jack Doyle out. I think he's like a nice little sleeper that you can throw into your lineup. Everybody else fucking stinks. Everybody else I hate. Uh, but I love you guys. And I love you for hanging out with me for this long. If you did, Robert, I love you for editing this video. As always, uh, make sure you're following Robert on Twitter at not Scott BDGE. I will link his description in the there I go again. There go that man. I will link his Twitter in the description as well as the comments. Make sure you text me. Just text me sweet nothings. Text me whatever the fuck you want. Text me the word no, and I'll, rete- I'll text you back and say fucking no right back to you. You cannot out-know me. You cannot out-know me. It ain't fucking possible. That's all I got. Make sure you check out playerprofiler.com. Okay? And uh, I will see y'all next week. Hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. I will not see you next week as I will see you tomorrow morning for the Saturday Q&A, which you can get access to on patreon.com forward slash BDGE. Man, my mind does not work when I don't get sleep. I have not got sleep yet this week. I don't know what's wrong with me. Does anyone have suggestions on how to fucking sleep like a normal human being outside of like avoid screens and don't fucking drink caffeine at 10 p.m.? Like outside of the obvious fucking shit that you find everywhere, how do I sleep? How does a normal human being get to sleep, okay? And listen, I don't really even have that much anxiety or stress. Like, it's a very healthy level of anxiety and stress. And most of it is, like, positive stress. Most of it is just, like, you know, um, motivation to get shit done. Like, I'm stressing about a project, but it's, like, a fun project that I get to work on. So, basically, the fucking, the point of that was if I am not sleeping because of stress or anxiety, because of my levels, then no one on earth would be sleeping. We'll put it that way. Why don't I sleep? I don't understand. I don't understand. I'm not going to a fucking doctor for this because he's probably just going to give me pills that make me groggy the next morning. All right. Y'all have listened to my bullshit enough. Instead of sleeping, we're just going to fucking keep pounding energy drinks. But listen, I cut my caffeine off. I cut it off at like noon. Okay. So that's not a problem. It's not the caffeine. Okay. I drink a lot of caffeine from like 8 a.m. till noon and then I cut it off. So by the time I get into bed, right, caffeine is a half life of five and a half hours, I think. So it takes about 10 hours to get out of your system. I'm ready to roll by then. Damn. Damn. Maybe I do have a lot of anxiety. I'll see y'all tomorrow.